Well, guys, it's time to get started, I suppose. And uh, before I um, get into trying to pair you guys up with a partner, if you don't have one, or help you decide what your subject would be, I want to point this out because a number of people mess this up a little bit. Subject matter, painting, sculpture, or architecture before 1300. I allow you to go up to 1400 or so, but I've been getting stuff like the Mona Lisa, Michelangelo, all this stuff that 16th century. It's not within the scope of this course. And I made mention of that in the quiz four, if you fall into that category. So this is what I wanted to settle on. Uh, and I might add this, that uh, there may be, how should I say this? Um, I gotta get to that is what I need. Um, it looks like, at least from the what has been turned on so far, turned in, come on. Share screen, come on, come on. There it is. No, oh, we want that. Okay, good. Um, I want to remind you guys at home on Zoom to send me an email and let me know that you participated. It's really kind of difficult to dig these participants out once the class is over. So anyway, just as a safety net, just so I give you credit for being here and participating. So presentations and topics. This is what we have so far, what I was about to say before I got all confused by the computer is that uh, we have actually a pretty good wide range of subjects. When you guys do these presentations, it looks like it's going to be a pretty good um, representation of art before 1400 globally. And so, yeah, we got uh, Jerusalem, Giza, Easter Island. I was happy to see that. Uh, Akhenaten, Egyptian again. Zemi Kahoba, Madison, you're on that. Caribbean from the 10th century, I believe. And I thought that was good. And another Egyptian, Hatshepsut. And so this is this all looks good, but as you can see, only got six groups, which is 12 people, and there are 19 of you. So with those 12, these are the unpaired. And uh, the ones here with question marks represent either no submission for quiz four, so I have no idea what you're looking into, or it may mean that whatever you wrote was outside the scope of this course. And so this is kind of open-ended for these people. And I have, just a second. Uh, I'm down doing mine myself. Daniel, if that's how you want to do that, uh, let me see how it works out. Um, okay. So, 
Do you see somebody on the list that you'd like to work with? Or do you see some thing on the list of artworks here that you'd like to look at, research, and present? So I guess we can go down the line here, Morea. What you think? Okay with whatever? Well, since you're so agreeable, you'd make a good partner for whoever, whoever the person is. Gavin, what do you got? Well, I'm, I'm really kind of forcing the issue here because we're kick, 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 running out of time. Uh, we got this week and next week, the week after is Thanksgiving, and then the week after that, when we come back, is when you should be done. You'll be presenting. So, Gavin, Maria, Tori. Okay. And Daniel said he wanted to do his own, which would kind of, in, in some ways, resolve one of my problems. Uh, Joshua, are you all even on participants? No, it's not here, so she, Joshua, Nina's not here too, uh, I don't see her on that list either, and Logan, oh. looks like you've got a wide choice of partners here, but what? I mean, the only reason I really chose uh, Nike as the same as the race is I like sneakers a lot. Yeah. And Nike, that statue. That's is, what they're named what after. They're Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I have quite a bit of uh, information on that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Because of Nike shoes. Yeah. I'm sure you'll find a, a lot. And. That kind of gets to one of the points I asked you to make in the presentation, legacy. And there is a legacy, it lasts all the way up till today. As we speak, as I walk and run, as I just do it, you say. Well, so what's the consensus? Should I assign partners? I think that's so awful. Maria. All right. All right. All right. And then I got Daniel. Along. So that's three. I need two more groups. Gavin, Tori, Joshua, and Nina. So, Gavin, what'd you say? Did you say something that could? No, I said I think perhaps maybe we have to. If you want to pick them. Oh, if I want to pick them. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, okay, I'll let you guys 
decide the subject, but the code of Hammurabi is like pretty huge. So, you know, plenty of stuff. And so, Joshua, it looks like, uh, well, he's not here. Looks like Gavin, you're paired with Joshua. You good with that? Okay, Gavin, thank you. And I, I was curious about this on your student view. You should, I think, have when you click on people, you have everybody else's email address. Good. I I haven't checked this class specifically, but I teach online and students are always going back and forth. And so the people on And let's see if I got the share for the people at home. Yeah, it looks good. See, that's what I'm talking about. Here's your login ID. Doesn't really give you a lot of information by design, but this is how you can get in touch with each other. Okay. And let me get my share going. Work. Ah. I just goofed it up. Yeah, I did. Hold on, guys. I'm too quick. All right. So at this point, you guys are hopefully on your way to doing the PowerPoint presentation. If you have any more questions, you got my email address too. Send me something through Canvas that'll, that'll absolutely work. And so... Here's what I need. Don't need the editing. I need the slideshow. No. You know what I did? Never mind. We can do. It. So you want to learn about late medieval Italy or you want to watch me goof around on this computer for a while? I'll take that Italy. Okay, good. Well, here's kind of what, how I want to preface what you're about to see. And that is, first of all, how the book is put together. It follows some kind of logic and it's not exactly, although it's roughly chronological, and it goes by area. We've seen that. And so uh, we had, uh, as you know, we kind of went around in a big circle. 
around through Southern Europe and the cave art. And then we went to the Mesopotamia. Then we went to Egypt and up through the Aegean, the Greece, the Rome, et cetera. But when we got to this period of time, we looked at Northern Europe almost exclusively. Everything we saw in chapters, in chapter 13 especially, was in Northern Europe. All of the stuff north of Italy. And they break Italy out as a separate culture. There's good reason for that. What happens in Northern Europe, as we saw, the primary emphasis, and almost you just take a look at, just do one of these kind of things. Um, see all slides. Ah, like this. And you'd see that most of those slides in chapter 13, the first part of them were cathedrals inside and out. And the other part was basically <laughs> manuscript illumination. And then a few freestanding sculptures. You didn't see much painting at all because that was what was happening in the North. In Italy, they took a different approach. And right after the uh, medieval era, you see this, this is painting, that, these are sculptural painting, painting on the walls, painting, 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 I think you get the idea. You see, that is, that is the big difference or it's one of the big differences, is that they mostly pursue painting. They do build churches, they build cathedrals, and they do sculpture, but it's completely different. They follow the same track, if you will, basically up to about 1100-ish, 12th century. That's why in the last chapter, chapter 13, we saw the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the Pisa Cathedral, and so on. There's a little bit that's kind of Gothic, but they, they move in an entirely different direction. And that's what we'll see. And so, as I said, they really focus on painting in a way that we don't see in the North. And there are some of these people who made these paintings in today's world, we use the whole name, Duccio di Buonisegna. But in a lot of texts, he just referred to as Duccio. And we see that kind of fame, that kind of notoriety, they follow these painters for centuries. And so why is it that when we have teenage mutant ninja turtles, which by the way, I don't follow, but I was doing today's New York Times crossword that said home of the teenage mutant ninja turtles and was five letters. Anybody knew what was? Sewer, S-E-W-E-R. Ah, who knew? Not me. Good thing I figured it out. But at any rate, we got the idea that we have the famous artist. And that does, we start to see the acknowledgement of some outstanding figures in Gothic Europe. We saw Abbott, uh, Chuse, we saw Gislbertus and a few other sculptors, but for the most part, they were anonymous, anonymous artists. And in, in the work of the architecture was almost entirely 
anonymous. In fact, they were probably put together by a group of engineers working for the clergy in that particular place on the direction of Rome. So, Duccio, virgin and child enthroned with saints. So you guys analyze the Madonna and child with saints, George and Theodore. You guys did a good job with that. Why that question, why I wanted you to really dig in on that was so important because it really describes iconography and it'll be the guiding principle in Christian art, one of them, for hundreds of years. So this is in 1308. This is 14th century. This is a mere 100 years before the Renaissance. And so what's different about Duccio's Madonna from what we saw? Well, let me kind of spell this out because I think to some extent you get kind of used to looking at these things and they kind of look the same after a while. But here we have the Madonna in throne. We knew that blue faded, darkened over time. We got the Christ. He doesn't have the, the gesture of the peace, doesn't have the book, doesn't have the orb. Does have the halo with the cross in it. And then we got all of these, <coughs> these saints. And they all represent different kind, different holy people in the Christian faith. And I'm not exactly sure. I think you could find some books and really dig into this to find out exactly who is who in this. But the important part is this, as opposed to what we've seen prior to this time. And that is, there's a real attempt here to create the illusion of three-dimensional space. And how does Duccio do that? Well, he has this throne, and it's not perfect linear perspective. It's what they would call intuitive perspective. But it does go back to something that you might consider to be a vanishing point. This side goes to the center. This side goes to the center, which gives it the illusion of depth, three-dimensional space. And here with the saints, he's used another device. Seems kind of simple, but it wasn't used for a long time overlapping and you see the row of angels behind here and then the saints and then these guys even in front of that that's that's much more three-dimensional than anything that we've seen most of what we see in the icons for the Byzantine era are essentially flat and so flat that a lot of those icons were very easily adapted to mosaics, which are really essentially pretty flat too, for the most part. And so that's really what we see going on in Italy at this time. And so we see, <clears throat> this is kind of an interesting thing. It's, an altarpiece. It's the front of the Metse, Metse, the, excuse me, I can't say that, that. I can't speak Italian and I got a mask on. So, you know, bottom line, an altarpiece. And it's on wood. Of course, it's huge. It's seven feet high and 13 feet wide gigantic and 
an altar piece from this Siena Cathedral. Now they start really making altar pieces uh, in a big way. And oftentimes these were made on wood. This is what they did. They painted tempera and gold leaf on wood. And what was the advantage to that? Wood meant that it wasn't like a fresco on the wall, stuck there permanently. You could, we had some pretty strong guys, you could pick this up and move it. And we'll see some other altar pieces that are smaller and they were designed. They actually have hinges on the wood panels. So you could fold them up and carry them. Why is that? Go back here. You may have in one of these cities, these city states like in Pisa or Florence or someplace, a cathedral. But there were a lot of people out in the rural areas, the little towns and villages. And making an altarpiece was really suited for picking up that altarpiece, carrying it out to these tiny little villages, these little, uh, these little towns, and celebrating mass. And so you'd have a, a traveling priest, clergy, and they would go celebrate mass, mass, excuse me, in, in these little town so so this is really kind of different too we don't see that so much yet in the north after a while they kind of start to influence each other but bottom line is that in northern europe they're mostly centered around the towns and a lot of those towns are walled off and so anyway the cities are where the big cathedrals are. And so anyway, here. And so they do have sculpture, Nicol Nicola Pisano, pulpit of the Bas baptistry in Pisa. And we just talked about Pisa a minute ago. And it is kind of considered sort of in between that Italian medieval and Northern Gothic. And you can see this baptistry is really like the Gothic cathedrals, well ornamented and almost every square inch of the surface is attended to. But this was done by an Italian and he's following some of the conventions that were established in Northern Europe, if you will. And this is the pulpit, which is where the priest would conduct the services. That's what the pulpit is all about, where you preach from. And you can see up back here, what's that? That's a ladder. So you'd actually be preaching from behind this. You'd walk up and preach to the choir, if you will. And here is some of the relief work and Annunciation, Nativity, the Adoration of the Shepherds. It's really kind of a whole bunch of the birth of Christ story sort of rolled into one. Uh, if you're a biblical scholar, you'll know that the accounts of the birth of Jesus are actually kind of different one to the other. One talks about the shepherds, the other talk about, we'll talk about the magi and so on. They're in different gospels, but here they are. And there's a sheep. And we think probably where were these guys? The magi bringing gifts. Yeah, anyway, bottom line. What they're doing too is kind of the same thing that we see in some of the sculpture from Northern countries, like the Virgin Mary from St. Denis, we'll show you in 
fleur de lis in her hand, got the baby, got her hip thrown out, looks young. Looks like a young mother, not like a pious saint, not stoic. It's actually humanizing. We see that. We see that big time in Italian art. And so the expressions become very, very important. Here's another. There it is, the Annunciation to the shepherd, there's a shepherd, there's a sheep, there's shepherds, etc. cetera. Um, again, very active, very emotional, giving indication of being human, of having feelings, expressing feelings. And something else here too, and this is really kind of cool, and I always, seem to want to attribute this to the Islamic influence, and that is that words can be incorporated into the artwork. It's, it's okay to have biblical quotes or an explanation of what's going on in the artwork. And so, <coughs> Bonaventura, Berlin Gary, St. Francis altarpiece. This is kind of a big deal here too. St. Francis becomes, as we saw, the Virgin Mary being adapted as more or less the patron saint of France. We start to see her all over the place. So say what the fleur de lis, the fleur de lis becomes the symbol for France. St. Francis becomes pretty much the patron saint of Italy. And the current Pope in the Catholic Church took his name from St. Francis, St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, bottom line, Popes, when they are uh, chosen and anointed to be Pope, they get to choose their name. In fact, that's a, that's a papacy tradition. That's a royal tradition, too, by the way. In royalty, there are all kinds of kings that were born with one name, kings, queens, and so on, born with one name, and then uh, ascending to the throne, they take on another name. And so anyway, St. Francis's legacy is this, that he, I'm going to run this up a little bit, that he was someone who was in a monastery, he was a monk, he was kind of shut off from the rest of the world by choice. And he was and is a, a patron saint of naturalist. By that I mean, he always preached about not harming any life. Don't kill don't kill animals, eat them. That's what plants are for, for example. And you often see St. Francis depicted with maybe a bird on his shoulder or something. It was just so well connected to the animal kingdom. And here he is, he's preaching to the birds. And that's what the story says that he would preach the word of the gospel to the animals, to the animal kingdom. And so he is, he's an unusual saint, but anyway, I want to show you Church of San Francesco, which is Italian for St. Francis. Uh, Assisi. St. Francis of Assisi. And I want to kind of zoom in on something here because this is a stark difference, as I was saying earlier, about painting being predominant in the art of Italy. This is what we have here. We have frescoes. We have panels painted 
disappear. In a Gothic church, you would have likely stained windows if you could accommodate them and or relief sculpture. That's really what a Gothic cathedral is. In this case, we have paintings illustrating the events and the people of the faith. And even so far as ceiling paintings, we won't see that in the North at all. And so this is one of the big differences between the North and the South. And so I showed you St. Francis, St. Francis Master. There are some of these artists, we don't know who they were, but they had a specialty. And this artist, we can follow, we know what presumably him, his work was, and that's how he made his living by making paintings of St. Francis. And so if you had a church, you wanted a picture, you wanted St. Francis on your wall, here you go. He's your guy. And so we don't know exactly who he is, but he became known as the St. Francis master. And we'll see other painters become highly specialized. And so now we're talking about late 13th century. Well, if I can project ahead in the 15th century, which is beyond the scope of this class, there's a painter called Fra Angelico. Fra means that he is a monk. Angelico meant that he was a master painter of angels. And we have lots of his work and we know who he was. And Fra Angelico painted these elaborate angels with magnificent multicolored wings. And so anyway, that's kind of how things were. And I wanted to kind of put this out there too, Santa Maria Novella. And so we see the multiple pointed arches and things that, you know, we're starting to see in the Gothic, but check out the alternating striped pattern in the archways. This is right out of Islamic art. And so that brings me to another point. And that is that Italy kind of reconciled more and did business with the cultures in the Middle East, much more than Northern Europe. And in part, because it was kind of an easy, if you will, it was an easy trip by boat from the ports on the Eastern Mediterranean up to the Italian peninsula. And as a matter of fact, you could sail that route and basically keep the shoreline in sight, which is how they did it before the compass and all this other stuff, navigation skills. But bottom line is that they traded and they interacted. And there's a theory that since a lot of their influence in Byzantine art resembles, really resembles that Byzantine style. And they build on that. In the North, not so much. They invent their own, their own kind of art. Chimabui, Madonna enthroned with angels and prophets. Prophets are down here. Here are the angels. And as we see in the north, the angels, I mean, excuse me, a lot of the sculpture becomes quite elaborate. Look at these wings. This predates Fra Angelico, but this is kind of what his stuff looks like. And so the angels become much more elaborate the enthroned Madonna and the attempt at overlapping the angels and 
giving you the illusion of three dimensions. This is not just the Madonna enthroned, but Madonna and the angels exist in a three dimensional space. It's not a flat icon. And so again, I'll gold leaf and tempera on wood. This is what they did. There was a lot of interaction, as I say, between the Middle East and Eastern Orthodox Church, which really kind of practiced Christianity in the old way. And so there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of exchange, exchange of ideas, etc. And so Pietro Cavallini, I want to kind of zoom in on this one too. Look at that. And as you can see, most of this fresco is pretty much falling off the wall. I guess if I were like 800 years old, that would be fun too. This is where they're going. This is a fresco on the west wall of Santa Cecilia. And on the bottom, apostles with Christ in the center. And we're going for a kind of naturalism too, because in, in a lot of ways, in Byzantine times, you wouldn't have done this. You wouldn't make Christ the same size as the apostle. He would be huge. And so it's a kind of a humanization, if you will. And Giotto, Giotto, 14th century, he was another big, famous, influential painter pre-Renaissance. And as a matter of fact, we got written accounts from some of the Renaissance artists that would go to the Arena Chapel, which was the masterwork of Giotto. Uh, and these artists would write about how magnificent the frescoes were. And it inspired them to a more humanistic approach to represent, representing biblical scenes, but just representing people at all. And so uh, we have the Madonna and Child. We still have some of the same conventions here. We see the young Christ giving the blessing. And we have the overlapping, but the overlapping here absolutely obscures some of the figures. So what does that tell you? tells you that maybe having it appear to be more real and more three-dimensional is more important than having everybody's face recognizably recognizably um, available. Nuh -uh. And so again, The wings inspire Fra Angelico. And again, this is an attempt at three-dimensional space, and they've kind of even done one better because now she has a canopy of sorts over her head. So this three-dimensional space is even, even more developed. And you see this, I'm talking about nitpicking. This all actually happened pretty fast in the uh, 13th and 14th century, the 1200s and the 1300s. And here's that arena chapel that people like Michelangelo raved about in his memoirs, in his diary. And so it's been restored and that's why we have these support bars up here on top. And why is that? Because after time, the walls were starting to pull away and bring them back and, and retrofit some support. 
But again, think about how different this is than a Gothic cathedral. In this, there, there's absolutely no stained glass windows. But every bit of the wall space is attended to, decorated, if you will. And so early 14th century, the arena chapel, and here is one of those panels. And this is lamentation. This is after they took Christ down from the cross and they were about to bury him, intern him, put him in the tomb. And so we see Mary, the mother of Christ. We see Magdalene. We see this guy right here. This guy. Who is that? Crucifixion pop quiz. All right, I give up. This is St. John the Apostle. He was the youngest of the apostles. And he is there begging the dead Christ to come back to life. That's what he was doing. He witnessed the crucifixion and he was imploring Jesus to come back to life. You're, you are God. You can do this. Come back. We don't want you to leave. That's what he's saying. And would the body language support that? Absolutely. Would the look on his face, would the weeping women, and this is kind of a big convention too that will persist, is that you don't see men crying so much in the old paintings, but you will see a lot of women actually crying. And so, anyway, there he is. And another thing about this, I want to show you. Giotto. Not so much here because the angels all seem to be of different, sending different messages here. One sitting here thinking, this one's crying, this one's coming down, and this one is agonizing, and, and so on. What happens with Giotto is that he starts to make the angels uh, small, and they become more playful. They become more than just guardian soldiers, as we see for a long time in the north, in the south, through the Byzantine era, those angels, and sometimes they carry spears, and they are there, as I said earlier, they got your back. The angels are animated, and this one here, welcome Jesus. This one here. Just say, so Giotto brings another level of humanity. And you take that as opposed to something like this. You can see they're moving that way, but Giotto kind of breaks the ice. Here, Giotto, entry into Jerusalem. This is from the Arena Chapel as well. And here he is, there's Christ. Anatomically, his size is appropriate. He's riding on the donkey. This is Palm Sunday. And in the Christian Bible, they talk about how Christ's entry into Jerusalem just prior to his crucifixion was a momentous occasion. It was, um, he rides in into Jerusalem a celebrated hero. And so anyway, there are the disciples back here. And here are the, the, the welcoming people that so on. I want to kind of point this out. 
It's even people climbing trees here with me <laughs> at this. Bottom line, here's the people, and this is the walls of Jerusalem. As I've said a few times in here, a lot of these cities were fortifications. They'd build these big walls around them because invaders would come in and they would attack and loot and kill and plunder and the people inside the city. So they, they basically these city states, and especially in Jerusalem, they were walled off. And so here the people are coming out to greet the Christ. However, the scale on this is kind of not particularly well done. As I said earlier about this perspective, it was still intuitive. They knew they wanted to make this three-dimensional. I knew they wanted to have the people come out of here, but you know, how do you get that to scale? How do you do believable space and believable perspective? And that usually comes into play with man-made structures, even if it's just a throne or a city wall or towers or something. But at any rate, this guy, Giotto, he was the guy. And we saw this, ready, the lamentation, uh, the betrayal of Jesus, very active, telling the story. <laughs> <Don't worry. coughs> There's Judas kissing Christ on the cheek. Betrayed, and that's how he identified Jesus, how do we know which one is Jesus? I'll point him out. I'll go up and kiss him on the cheek. These Roman soldiers take him away. Um, and so there's a little part of this, though. I, I want to kind of point into this. What's going on right there? See, this guy, he's one of the Pharisees. He's one of the guys, the accusers. These are the soldiers, obviously, with the spears. He's cutting off this guy's ear. That's St. Peter. And Peter decides that they're going to fight back when they come to get Jesus. And he pulls out a knife and cuts off this guy's ear. One of the Roman soldiers. And what does Christ do? He heals this guy. He picks up the ear, puts it back on, and tells Peter, that's that's not that's not appropriate, that's not right, that's not being a good Christian. And so that's what that story is. And and to the extent that they're actually telling stories in a lot of ways is pretty remarkable because like in the north they'll give you a picture a snapshot of time a snapshot of an event or a snapshot of a person except in the manuscript of illumination but bottom line is there's some more duccio um, contemporary of Giotto and uh, and so yeah and this is Duccio's arrival into Jerusalem and you can see there's a real attempt to make this much more real make the buildings bigger still the people are kind of big for that entryway but and you see this one, the Last Supper. Had to tilt the table up to show you what was going on. Again, the idea of 
linear perspective had not been invented. They had to do what they could to tell the story. But, um, but at any rate, it's really quite remarkable what they do in this time period. There's that Duccio arrival into Jerusalem uh, and his betrayal of Jesus and And there he is. There's St. Peter cutting this guy's ear off out of violence in there. Um, and so talk a little bit about the architecture. And they do follow some of the conventions of Gothic art, but they deviate from it as well. And how that happens is this. We see here we see the tympanum, we see uh, the, the portal, the entryway, we see some of the lancet shaped stained glass. However, where there would be sculpture in a Gothic cathedral, we see paintings. It's an Italian thing. It's where they change. And for a long time, through the Renaissance, there's this kind of idea that uh, all of the best painters in the world are Italian. In about 100 years, the artists of the North will challenge that notion. But check these sides out, sides of this cathedral, striped. Decorative, a pattern, not statues, not paintings, not any other adornment except the striped pattern. Siena Cathedral, and they have this giant spire. And again, uh, up here on the top, painting. It's just a little bit more like Gothic, but Giovanni Pisano. Whoa, did we see him before? Here. So one of the things that happens in Italy at this time, we start to know who these people are, and oftentimes they have a number of skills. They are architects, they are painters, and they are sculptors. And so uh, that'll persist for a long time, so much so that they, um, that future generations of Italian artists are oftentimes multi-talented work in a lot of different ways. And they call those Renaissance men. Probably the most famous of them, Leonardo da Vinci, can paint, sculpt, draw. He's an inventor. He's a mathematician. He's a physician. He, he, all of this. And so what happens out of this is that we got people like Simone Martini. And what you see here, right here on the painting itself, is some of the architecture. It's wood, to be sure, and it's not functional. It's purely decorative, but it looks like it could have come from a Gothic cathedral. And you see, this is 1333. We're almost in mid-14th century. This becomes what will, this will be known as the international style. When I was going on about the trade routes from the Middle East and this sort of cross-pollinization of ideas from the Middle East, they kind of come to fruition in a lot of different ways. And in this way, this is actually taking some elements of the Gothic, some of 
what was going on in late Gothic Italy and some Byzantine elements all kind of rolled up in one. And so we have the Madonna in throne, but you know, take a look at that body language. She's kind of a little, she's a little hesitant here. She's kind of backing off a little bit, which is probably what almost anyone would do if you were approached by an angel that you've never seen before. And the angel was telling you that you were going to have a baby. Hmm. And so th this is the international style and it typically takes the adornment of the Gothic, some of the iconography from Byzantine and throw in some of the things that the Italians want to do, A with expression, B with the illusion of three dimensional space. And Pietro Lorenzetti, he's one of two Lorenzetti brothers that are mid, early, mid 14th century, very prominent. Again, we got real names for these people. It's an important aspect of this. And this is the birth of the Virgin. So this is where Mary is born. And so check this out. It's kind of international style too because it has some of the elements of a Gothic cathedral. And it's got and it's painted in a way to give it the illusion of three dimensions. And this is kind of clever here too because this sec this first column right here also serves as a wall. And this is how basically women gave birth at that time and for many centuries thereafter is that giving birth was a truly a woman's job, both in being pregnant and having the child and all of the attendants would be women too. And you talk about know, a midwife would be the one actually doing the delivery, but women here, uh, to wash the baby, to, to help her have this child. And so, and as customary, the men would be outside. It would be separated. It would be a witness or party to the birth of a child. And so, like I say, we still have some of the terminology of midwife is a uh, is among those words. And so, Palazzo Publico in Siena, Italy. And so we're starting to see public buildings emerge. We started to see that in the North too. I showed you the Hall of the Cloth Guild in Bruges. This is happening here in Siena. And so we see this emergence of, of everyday people we see the emergence of a working class and a skilled trades class. And we see the emergence of, of actual governance here. And typically like today, those who are wealthy and those who have political power actually start to take over more and more. It's not just a birthright. And so, this happened, this is Siena. This is Florence. Palazzo della Signora. Same thing. Not a church. We're starting to see all kinds of buildings emerge. And I want to do this last Lord Zetti. Ambrosio, peaceful city, detail from the effects of good government. So that's why I was going on about this, this emergence of a whole new class. There is a governing class. It's not the lords and the ladies and the dukes and the duchesses. It becomes where people are actually starting to run things more themselves. 
And what we're coming out of here is the bubonic plague, which kind of takes many people out of the population. A large swath of the population just drops over and dies. That becomes very beneficial for those who survive because you have all of these cities, you have all of this arable land, you got all of this wealth, you got all of this means of production and fewer people to share it with. And so good government, good government should be like this, that you let people do what they do. And so you got shopkeepers here. Uh, you got some of the royalty kind of parading through. There's another shop and some more and people are buying. This is kind of a, an allegory about let them be, let them do business. Secondly, there's an equivalent peaceful country. And this is the countryside and people go out and work. Here are the overlords, but bottom line, when everything's running properly, everybody does well. And so it's, it's time to ask for any questions. No questions. I got a shout out, Tori, ACDC, black and black. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, in that case, I will see you guys Thursday. Thank you.